Margaret Ellen Fox lived in Burlington, New Jersey, with her parents and four brothers. In 1974, the 14 year old graduated from St. Paul's Roman Catholic School and was looking forward to starting high school in the fall. That summer, one of her cousins, Lynn Parks, was looking to work as a babysitter while school was not in session. She placed an ad in the classified section of a local newspaper and received a reply from a man claiming his name was John Marshall. He told Lynn that he lived in the nearby town of Mount Holly and needed someone to watch his five-year-old son from 9.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m., five days a week. He would pay her $40 a week, in addition to bus fare, to watch the boy at his house, which he said had a pool and a swing set to help keep the child entertained. Lynn's parents refused to let her take the job since it was out of town, so she gave John Marshall's name and phone number to Margaret in case she wanted to earn spending money over the summer. Margaret called John Marshall on June 19th and agreed to start work two days later. That morning, she was supposed to take the bus to the stop at High and Mill Streets in Mount Holly, where he would pick her up in his red Volkswagen. The following day, however, John Marshall called the Fox home again. Margaret was not home, so he spoke to her father, David, instead. According to David, John told him that there had been a death in his family, and he would not need Margaret to start the babysitting job until the following Monday, June 24th. David, who was very protective of his children, did his best to extend the conversation so that he could get a better read of the man who was hiring his daughter. Since he did not pick up on any red flags during the conversation, and because the job would only be during the day, he allowed Margaret to take the position. On Monday morning, Margaret and her younger brother Joe walked to the bus stop. Joe watched Margaret board the 840 bus and then went home. Witnesses would later report seeing Margaret get off the bus in Mount Holly. Margaret had been instructed by her parents to call home when she arrived at John Marshall's house. The call never came. When Margaret failed to call, her parents began trying to get in touch with her. Margaret had left notes by the phone that she had been jotting down during her conversations with John Marshall. Her parents found the phone number John had provided and tried calling it. There was no answer. David Fox called a friend who was on the police force in East Hampton Township, just east of Mount Holly, and the two men began searching the streets of Mount Holly for any sign of Margaret. Back in Burlington, neighbors of the Foxes began organizing search teams as well. None of them found any sign of Margaret. The police would not accept a missing persons report the same day Margaret was last seen, so David Fox was at the police station at midnight to file one as soon as it was June 25th. On June 28th, the Foxes received a phone call demanding $10,000 for Margaret's safe return. This came the day after Margaret's disappearance was first reported in the local media. The next day, they received a letter with the same demand. Margaret's parents rushed to get the cash together, but they never received any instructions on how to deliver it. They did receive another letter two days after the first, calling off the exchange. Given the fact that these demands did not come until after Margaret's case had become more widely known, it is quite possible that the call and the letters were hoaxes. The second letter was also signed so as to indicate that it came from the SLA, a group which was heavily featured in the national news at the time, but was not active in New Jersey, furthering suspicion that it was not really from whoever had Margaret. The phone number Margaret had been given by the man calling himself John Marshall was traced back to a payphone outside of an A&P grocery store in Lumberton, New Jersey. There was a man named John Marshall who worked at the store and who was therefore questioned by police. He passed a polygraph exam, which is not conclusive evidence, but he was also working at the store the day Margaret disappeared and had co-workers who could confirm that he was there. Since John and Marshall are both very common names, it is unclear if the caller had coincidentally made up this alias on his own or if he had been trying to implicate the store employee. Men named John Marshall who lived in the area were interviewed by police, as were people who owned red Volkswagens. The FBI compared fingerprints found on the letters sent to the Foxes to the limited pool of fingerprints they had on file at the time. David Fox kept pictures of Margaret in flyers with information about her case taped in the window of his car to spread the word about her disappearance wherever he went, 
He also went to church every day to pray for his daughter's return. There was a confession in the case in 1976, but it proved to be a hoax. John Marshall was never identified, and Margaret has never been found. Margaret's parents have both since passed away, but her brothers continue to hope for resolution in her case. Eighteen-year-old Olive Walker was one of eleven children and lived in Rotorua, New Zealand. Olive was very quiet, and her father did not allow any of his younger daughters to have boyfriends. She was therefore planning to spend the night of Friday, May 15, 1970, babysitting for her 25-year-old sister Mary. She left her home around 6.45 to walk to Mary's house on Malfoy Road. She was seen walking by witnesses at 7.50, but never arrived at Mary's house. It would not be until the next morning, when Mary watched the news, that she learned why her younger sister had never shown up to babysit her children. Around 11.30 Friday night, a group of teenagers arrived at a highway rest area a few miles south of Rotorua. The area was known locally as a lover's lane. There, the teenagers discovered Olive's body. She was fully clothed, but her autopsy indicated that she had been raped. She had died of head trauma inflicted by a blunt object. The medical examiner determined that Olive had died sometime between 9 and 11 p.m., leaving at least one hour of time between when she was last seen and when she was killed. At the scene, police found a size 6 shoe print, as well as a set of tire tracks. One of the tire prints was distinctive, but no match to it was ever found on a vehicle. Approximately 370 different people were considered suspects during the initial investigation. However, no arrests were ever made in Olive's case. More than four decades after Olive's murder, Detective Sergeant Jack Collins, who had worked on Olive's case, told the media that he had been pressured by the then Assistant Police Commissioner Bob Walton to focus the investigation on a relative of Olive's who had a criminal record. Since there was no evidence implicating this relative, and Collins believed him to be innocent, he had refused. The following day, he was removed from the criminal investigation branch and never worked as a detective again. Olive's father passed away in 1982. Olive's sister Mary attributes his death to Olive's murder and the stress and heartache it caused him. Olive's case still remains unsolved after almost 50 years. October 24, 1953, was the night of Lacrosse State College's homecoming game. Vigo Rasmussen, a professor at the college, was planning to attend the game with his wife and seven-year-old daughter Rosalind. However, the family's usual babysitter was a student at the college and was also going to attend the game, leaving the Rasmussens without anyone to watch their 20-month-old daughter Janice at home. Professor Rasmussen asked another professor, Dr. Richard Hartley of the biology department, if his 15-year-old daughter Evelyn would be interested in filling in as the family's babysitter for the night. Despite her young age, Evelyn was an ideal candidate for a babysitter. The student at Central High School was a straight-A student, active in her church, and had a reputation for being hard-working but kind-hearted. Professor Rasmussen picked her up at 6.30 on the night of the 24th. Evelyn brought flowers for the Rasmussens with her. Before Professor Rasmussen, his wife, and Rosalind left for the game, he asked Evelyn to feed Janice and put her to sleep in her crib around 7 o'clock. Evelyn brought seven school books with her to study after the baby went to sleep. Dr. Hartley had instructed Evelyn to call home at 8.30 that night so he could make sure she was all right alone in the Rasmussen's home. The call did not come in at the prescribed time, which was out of character for the usually obedient Evelyn. Dr. Hartley called the Rasmussen house several times, but Evelyn did not answer any of the calls. Worried, Dr. Hartley then decided to go over to the Rasmussen's house on Hoeschler Drive to check on Evelyn. When he arrived, he could see lights on in the house and hear the radio playing. When he knocked on the door, however, Evelyn did not answer. The door was still locked, so he went to look in the front window. Through it, he saw his daughter's broken glasses and one of her shoes on the floor. Her school books were scattered about the room, 
and the furniture was knocked out of place. Dr. Hartley frantically went around the house looking for a way inside. In the back of the house, he discovered that the screen had been removed from a window in the basement. Using it to enter the house, Dr. Hartley did not find his daughter, but did find Janice safe in her crib. There was blood inside the house and outside of it, trailing through the yard and on the side of a neighbor's garage. The blood type was found to be consistent with Evelyn's. Police bloodhounds could only trace Evelyn's scent for two blocks, leading to speculation that she had been taken away in a car. This theory was strengthened when a witness came forward, saying they had seen a young girl in a two-toned Buick with two men. The vehicle had sped out of the Rasmussen's neighborhood at approximately 7.15, the night Evelyn vanished. The search effort for Evelyn was one of the largest in the history of the state of Wisconsin. Neighbors of the Rasmussen's and faculty and students from La Crosse State were some of the earliest volunteers. Groups ranging from the National Guard to the Boy Scouts also helped in the effort. Amateur boaters searched waterways, and local hunters were asked to look for clues in the woods. Aerial searches were also performed by helicopter. Within just a few days, more than 2,000 people were part of the search for Evelyn. The Tuesday after Evelyn vanished, Bloodstained undergarments that could have belonged to her were found under an overpass of Highway 14, two miles south of La Crosse in the town of Shelby. This blood was also consistent with Evelyn's blood type. The area had been searched the day before the garments were found, meaning that they had probably been thrown from a passing car up on the highway either Monday night or early on Tuesday. Also found dumped southeast of La Crosse in a different location were a pair of size 11 sneakers and a denim jacket, each stained with blood that was the same type as Evelyn's. The tread of the sneakers matched footprints found outside of the Rasmussen's home, and there had been imprints in some of the blood stains at the house that appeared to be from denim fabric, potentially linking the jacket to the scene. Investigators argued that the jacket was too small to be worn by someone with size 11 feet, and that these two pieces of evidence supported the theory that Evelyn had been abducted by two men, although shoe size and clothing size do not necessarily correlate in this way. Over the years, the notoriety of the case led to discredited confessions and wild theories, but no further signs of Evelyn. The Rasmussens sold their home, which they had built just a few years prior, shortly after Evelyn went missing. According to Rosalind, the older daughter of the family, her father descended into a constant state of paranoia about the safety of his family after the incident. In an interview for a news article published just before the 25th anniversary of their daughter's disappearance, Richard and Ethel Hartley admitted that they had lost hope about ever learning what had happened to Evelyn. Evelyn's case remains without answers, decades after both her parents passed away. <laughs>